and I'd like to learn more about the community as well, in fact, who's here tonight. So I was wondering if people could raise their hand, if they could tell me how many people here have a personal interest in ADHD, perhaps a family member, a close friend. Okay, quite a few. And how many students are here? All right, and how many researchers? Okay, I think I know all the researchers. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm hoping that this is a, um, an informal way as well as getting to know people in the community and what their needs are. So I do have a formal presentation, but please feel free to interrupt, to ask questions, to ask for further details and so forth. And, um, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Well, we'll have more of a discussion time after, but I really do want to hear about what some of the needs are and interests and, and questions that people here have as well. Tonight I'll be speaking about some general prevalence about ADHD, general characteristics about the disorder, some of the research we've done, some of the research that we hope to do. I'm just going to touch a little bit on treatment, not a whole lot, so perhaps because I really think that could be a whole other talk. So we'll get to some of that as well. So one of the common questions I get is, is ADHD a new disorder and is it growing? Because I seem to hear about it all the time and I don't remember hearing about it when I was a child. Well, in 1845, there was a German psychiatrist who wrote a poem for his, his son for a book that he published. He was, um, wrote a book about several types of children, but this one was about fidgety Phil, and I'll just read a couple of stanzas from it and, and tell me if it sounds familiar. Let me see if Philip can be a little gentleman. Let me see if he is able to sit still for once at table. Thus spoke in earnest tone the father to his son, and the mother looked very grave to see Philip, mis Philip so misbehave. But Philip, he did not mind, his father who was so kind, he wriggled and giggled, and then I declare, swung backward and forward and tilted his chair. Just like any rocking horse, Philip, I am getting cross. See the naughty, restless child, growing still more rude and wild, till his chair falls over quite, Philip screams with all his might, catches at the cloth, but then, what makes matters worse again, down upon the ground they fall, glasses, bread, knives, forks, and all. How Mama did fret and frown when she saw them tumbling down, and Papa made such a face, Philip is in sad disgrace. So, there's a history here. It's not a new disorder. And in 1902, George Still also wrote about it and described it. He emphasized more the biological, uh, what he thought substrates of the disorder. The name has changed to several times, reincarnations, but essentially the core features really have not changed. We do know that there is a highly prevalent disorder, but there's some uh, disagreement about the actual prevalence rate. But most people like to be, like myself, be conservative and suggest it's three to five, maybe three to seven percent of children who have it. We now know that it's one of the most common adult psychiatric disorders as well as most children with the disorder continue to exhibit the symptoms. And a recent study showed that 4.4% of adults we suspect also have the disorder. What I think has garnered a lot of public attention is the increase in stimulant usage. And some of that is because we're getting, getting better at diagnosing it. Females are now being diagnosed with in the past they hadn't been. People with an attentive type. And also, we now recognize that it persists until adolescence and adulthood. When I was in graduate school, I was told point blank by one of my professors that he didn't understand really why I wanted to, to study ADHD because within adolescence, the disorder disappeared. So how wrong he was. <laughs> so these are the, the core symptoms, inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. And these are the, the uh, symptoms within the inattention domain. And as you can see, most of them focus on problems with disorganization, whether or not the person has, has attended to um, information, whether they're forgetful or not, whether they're able to maintain focus. One of the major problems with these symptoms is that they're very subjective. And I think everybody in this room at some point has had some of these problems. Who many, how many people here have forgotten their password to different email accounts and so forth? How many people here have lost their keys? So it becomes very difficult from a diagnostic standpoint to determine sometimes whether or not this is a significant issue. These are the hyperactive and impulsive symptoms, and these are clearly something that are easier to, to uh, assess, and they're certainly more objective in some ways. So fidgeting with hand, hands or feet, I think with the adults they're fidgeting in their head as they get older rather than running around the room. Um, 
So we don't see too much running or climbing with the adults, but we do see them checking their email constantly and going for breaks in the snack room and so forth, doing those sorts of things. The impulsivity may be also very different in the adults and that compared to the children, but they get people in trouble equally often. Um, interrupting is, uh, is an issue that is throughout the lifespan. Talking excessively, I think, is one of the best predictors of ADHD and so forth. We're particularly interested in our group something called slow cognitive tempo, which we think is a subtype of the inattentive subtype of ADHD. There's a, there's a number of us in the ADHD field who think that the many people who are diagnosed with the inattentive subtype of ADHD are really just what we call sub-threshold combined type. So they probably have some of the hyperactivity and some of the impulsivity, but they don't quite meet criteria. But we think this is a whole different group. This is a group of people who seem like space cadets. So they're daydreamy, they're unfocused, they're drifting off somewhere else. But they don't cause problems, typically in the classroom, because they're not disruptive. So they also don't get a whole lot of attention, and it may be harder to diagnose them. But we also think that treatment for them may differ. There's only been two studies looking at the inattentive subtype, which this, we think, isn't part of that. And it looks like they may respond to lower doses of medication. So this is an understudied area and something that we're trying to explore in our group. This is just a um, diagram to show you what happens as, as one matures. As I said, the inattention, um, we think, continues. And as I said, I think these continue, but in a different form, and they're not as observable. So I think my professor was right in that hyperactivity may, may uh, diminish, but it doesn't actually go away. I think it's just in different forms. Now, there's lots of problems associated with ADHD as well. So ADHD in and of itself, I think, causes significant issues across settings, but there's also lots of issues that are, are um, concomitant with it, such as academic issues. So even if you have a child who's very bright, if they're having a hard time keeping up with their work and they're not turning in their homework assignments, that's a problem. A lot of the children wind up having a need for tutoring, a large percentage have to repeat a grade, a number of them are also in special education and require special services. There's also a tremendous burden on the caregiver. It can be much more stressful to parent a child with ADHD. And their relationships can be disturbed in, um, with peers, with parents, and for the adults, with uh, coworkers and spouses. There's actual um, statistics also for disorders that also are very highly co-occurring with ADHD. And you can see there are a number of them. And some of these might just be bad luck because some of these are very common disorders, such as anxiety disorder. But some of them, I think, are actually related to the ADHD as well, especially this oppositional defiant conduct disorder, tic disorder. And learning problems is probably also related. And so researchers are trying to figure out the relationship between these and what treatment might differ for how these combinations occur. So as I said earlier, most people with ADHD continue to exhibit the symptoms as they mature. Unfortunately, there are some other situations and uh, symptoms that occur that worsen their problems. So there's a very uh, high rate of antisocial behavior that occurs. For, for adolescents, there may be greater uh, number of suspensions, dropping out of school. They start to engage in risky behaviors. Adolescence is a time of risky behaviors. You couple that with ADHD, and it's even more problematic because these kids are impulsive. They're not thinking things through. and. Um, and their inattention, maybe they're not doing as well in their schoolwork and so forth. So that combines to really create some difficulties for these, for these children. So there's a greater use of alcohol and cigarettes. There's been two reports on that there's riskier sexual behavior. There's a higher rate of STDs in this population. There's also their initiation to sexual behavior is earlier as well. And their, uh, their uh, pregnancy with their first child is actually younger. There's also lots of evidence nowadays that they have a much higher rate of automobile accidents. So these sorts of behaviors as well not cause just problems for the person with ADHD, but their family members and society as well. So this is a little cartoon that reminds me of some people with ADHD who are maybe are the class clowns, but they, they're able to compensate. They find their niche because when you look around, it can be some of the comedians, Howie Mandel, very clearly has ADHD and OCD. Um, so I think some of them can do okay. So this cartoon says, your son repeatedly disrupts a class with laughter. I was wondering if you were interested in an agent. And I think we'll talk later about how I think kids with ADHD really need these immediate reinforcers. And being the class clown sometimes is a way to get that, and also a way to get out of uh, 
difficult work if you're having problems with it. So what does it look like in adults, the ADHD? Well, again, there's the disorganizations, there's procrastinations. So when I see adults with ADHD, a lot of times when they come to me, it's because they're tired of hitting the wall. They're not able to function unless they have a deadline. And until they're right up against that deadline, do they start working on their, their, uh, their, uh, their work? And that's oftentimes when they get frustrated and they have anxiety and they decide to seek help. But there's also, there's also frequent shifting of activities. One of my stories is about how I've had a number of people who were great salespeople. They did really well in sales because it was always novel. They were meeting new people, it was exciting, and they also did a lot of consulting. And then they got promoted to desk work. And they hated it. That was not their cup of tea because they couldn't shift so often. So this is a, oftentimes a, a difficulty, and when you're constrained, it can be more of a difficulty with adults. Impulsive speech, that's what gets them in trouble sometimes with partners and, and in business. Um, they may have temper problems, problems with authority, and then you can have a, an adult with ADHD is more likely to have a child with ADHD. So that, I think, also affects their parenting skills. So what do we know about adults um, of ADHD? Well, there's, at this point, there's a number of studies where they've been following people for several years. So one thing that I found very interesting was that whether or not a person has adult ADHD is uh, whether or not they meet criteria sometimes is depend highly dependent upon who you ask about whether or not they have the symptoms. And it turns out sometimes when you ask people with ADHD, they're much less likely to recognize the symptoms. But they've actually followed a number of cohorts now where they were studied in childhood, so they know they had ADHD, they had to be to, be to qualify for the studies, their parents were involved and so forth, and now they're young adults. And when you ask them whether or not they had ADHD, they deny it. Yet there's all these records, and if you ask their parents, they'll say, oh yeah, they've still got the problems. So they may not always be the best self-reporters about the symptoms. And so sometimes when you're asking an individual, you have to go to other sources for information. So more on, on the outcome. People with ADHD tend to have fewer years of education. They have higher rates of unemployment. As we said before, more antisocial behavior, more accidents. And they've actually looked at recently productivity, and they've looked at ability to earn, and of course, if you have fewer years of education, you're not able to um, advance as far in your, in your college and, or degree, you're going to earn less. And indeed, they've done a study that shows that individuals with ADHD actually have less earning capacity than peers. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the research that we've been doing and some of the research in general in the field. The past 10 years or so, I would say, is really dedicated to looking at what we call executive functions. And executive functions is what it sounds like, the executive, what's in charge and control. And oftentimes, that involves the prefrontal cortex, anterior cingulate, parts of the brain, where we think they help coordinate the rest of uh, the brain and how people are acting and processing information. And so most of the research has been looking at these particular areas, working memory, and I'll talk quite a bit about that because that's an area I've been working in, behavioral inhibition, whether or not people see certain things on the screen, whether or not they can inhibit their responding and so forth, planning ability, verbal fluencing, motor sequencing, and sense of time. And in some sense, these are probably all related, and a number of us, as I said, are looking at how, these, um, how they differentiate between different subgroups as well. My interest in working memory really was um, initiated by a number of my patients. And I was working with a lot of college students. I was doing a fair, fair amount of, I had worked with children for a no, number of years, but I was working with a fair amount of adults at this point. And the college students would talk about some difficulties that they were having in reading. They would comprehend what they were reading, but they'd have to reread and reread the information. And they said the problem was that they could read, they could understand a paragraph that they were reading, but they could not remember what they had read in the paragraph before. And because they had to keep rereading and rereading, it was really slowing them down. And so it wasn't a, a reading comprehension issue, which I think is oftentimes what people, when they think they're having difficulties with reading is, it's actually their working memory that was interfering. The other thing that I had people report to me is that when they were trying, they were in a lecture setting and they would be taking notes, they would have a hard time listening to the professor and taking notes at the same time. And that's another instance where it requires working memory because you have to constantly update the information that you're, you're, you're listening to. 
and also transcribe that and manipulate that information into written notes. A very concrete example for everybody here is I'm, I'm sure everybody here has been given a phone number and had to remember it, maybe didn't have a pen and paper around or something. And so think about what you might do to remember that phone number. What I would do is I would say the number to myself. Turns out not everybody does it that way. But that's a perfect example of, of working memory that we use in every day. What I, I often found when I would interview couples is that I would hear one spouse say that they would interrupt the other one, not because they were impulsive and that they were prone just to interrupting because what they said had to say was more important, but that if they didn't get their thought out right then, they were going to forget it. So it turned out with them was actually an issue with working memory. So as I said, this is really what started my, or planted the idea for me to pursue this area. In terms of techniques that I tend to use, I've been the past several years using primarily behavioral measures on people with ADHD, but as well as functional neuro neuroimaging. And as Dr. Brown said earlier, I am a psychologist by training. And as a psychologist, I'm very interested in the environment and alterations in how when one receives information and so forth, and how that affects the internal processes as well. And functional neuroimaging is a wonderful method for looking at that because we can present different situations to an individual and look at how that affects biology. What was really neat about functional neuroimaging for me is that I think it actually taught me something about behavior that I could not have seen if I had just been observing behavior, rather than not, so it wasn't just limited really to the biology. It also was a great mechanism for me to learn about future questions and other studies that we could do, and also I think had some hints for us in terms of treatment. So I'll tell you some more about how, uh, how that happened. This is a small group. This was our first neuroimaging study in ADHD. And it was the first one actually looking at working memory using functional neuroimaging. And in this study, these are slices from a control group. These are groups where the, the brains are, uh, with the computer program, are group averaged together. And then this the ADHD group. And what you're seeing are different slices, what we call axial slices down the brain. And these yellow areas are areas where there's significantly greater activation with a working memory task versus a control task. And in the images here, the right side is reversed to the left side. So if it's the right and the right side, these are actually activations in the left hemisphere. And when I was acquiring these data, I was using a working memory task that was a, a, an auditory task where individuals heard information over headphones and they had to respond verbally. Their eyes were closed. When we got our first data set back, I was looking at it with my, um, with my mentor at the time, and he said, Julie, I thought you were doing an auditory task. And I said, I am. And he said, well, there's all these activations in the, in the visual areas, occipital, precuneus, parietal, he said, are you sure their eyes are closed? I said, I'm, I'm standing right next, and this is with PET imaging. This is be, before we were using fMRI. And with PET imaging, you can be right there in the room. I said, their eyes are closed. I'm observing them. He said, well, I don't understand what they're doing. And I said, well, let's ask them. So I approached the subjects, and I said to the ADHD subjects, your hearing was a number task. I said, you're hearing these numbers. What are you doing during the task? And they would describe very vividly to me how they would hear numbers but then they would see it. So they would actually picture the numbers in their head. And some of them were very elaborate in their descriptions. So they could tell me what color the numbers were in. They could tell me how they'd hear one number would be on the right side, and then it would move to the left, and another number would be on the right side. One guy told me he was actually getting a little nauseous because he was going back and forth on the number line in his mind. So this was something I never would have considered. I never would have thought that people would be using these strategies, and I never would have thought to ask because we didn't have data like these. So functional imaging, this is an instance where it taught me something about behavior. And so what we found indeed is that the ADHD subjects were more likely to use regions of their brain that were involved with visual processing, and there was also some um, areas related to motor processing, whereas the control subjects were much more likely to use frontal regions, and they were using regions in, in the left hemisphere that were related to verbal processing, and they were using phonological strategies. So I suspect when they were hearing the numbers, they would do what I would do. They would repeat the numbers out loud to themselves. 
And these areas of the brain, this is where the executive functioning systems are usually ascribed to, are probably, we, we hypothesize, not working as well to help in terms of the, and help uh, recruiting other areas of the brain to um, assist with, with processing the data. So we did some other uh, studies similarly with adults, and we found also evidence that it was similar, that there was much more evidence in the adults of using uh, the adults with ADHD using visual motor areas of the brain, whereas the control subjects tend to use more verbal, verbally-based strategies. But our next question was children. And I was particularly interested in children for a number of reasons, but one reason is I was, became very interested in the idea of compensation, this idea that maybe they were using these visual strategies because they're compensating for verbal strategies that don't work. So the question was if you went to a younger age and they were doing working memory tasks, would they also use similar compensation strategies? And so we had to re we uh, developed the task. We changed it slightly because we could not use auditory stimuli because it's very noisy in the scanner. We also didn't want them to speak because that also affects data acquisition. So we uh, developed a task that was similar. And the way the task works is about every three seconds, they would see a number on a screen. And the number would actually go away. But I don't know how to do that in PowerPoint. And uh, a new, car a new uh, screen would come up. And they would have to add the top number to the previous number and indicate whether the number on the bottom is correct or not. And then that would go away. And they have to add this to this and say whether that was correct or not. And same here, and indicate whether it's correct or not. And I'm going to speed up here, because John is telling me I only have about probably 14 minutes left now. I'm OK? OK. <laughs> All right. And, um, and so similarly, we found in children, this is a, a, a group of, of children again. This is where we have activations in the brain where the regions are more active in the control subjects than they are in the ADHD subjects. And these are regions of the brain where it's more active in the ADHD subjects than in the control subjects. Again, these are group average brains. So these are a number of children whose brains are averaged together. And these are just slices, axial slices through the brain. And the more significant it is, is that the hotter uh, the, um, the color is, is in the images here. And so, and this time, right is right and left is left in these images. So again, we found the ADHD individuals, they were using areas related to motor. They're using basal ganglia. They're using insula and so forth primarily. And in the, in the control subjects, they're using some of that, but they tend to use more frontal as well and left hemisphere. And again, I suspect the left hemisphere is probably related to verbal processing and so forth. So again, we replicated in some sense that children, at least at these ages, aren't doing tasks a whole lot differently from the adults. It would be really neat to look at much younger children, but that's hard to do in a scanner because one thing about ADHD is people wiggle around when you have ADHD and you need to keep very still. So we're looking at other methods potentially to get at that. Okay, so implications of what we've done are, are multiple. One is, again, I think there's this idea that there's an issue of compensatory uh, mechanisms or alternative strategies that people with ADHD are using. And one of my questions is, is whether or not you can look at that from an educational standpoint. So can people with ADHD be taught to use traditional strategies, such as verbal strategies, repeating a number to themselves and so forth? Or is that just never going to work? Is that something that they're just incapable of doing or so inefficient for them that they're better off being taught how to use their compensatory strategies? And would that, in the long run, be more successful for them? I think ultimately the issue is that people without ADHD can walk into a setting or, or begin a task, and I think their brain is essentially more flexible so that they can adapt and use whatever strategy is probably best for meeting the task demands. Or in the long run, I think the people with ADHD are in some sense more restricted. And we have some other data that suggests that, that even when people with ADHD are performing as well as control subjects, they're working a lot harder. So they're activating many more regions. And so it's much more inefficient. And I think that sometimes when you see kids with ADHD and they're doing their homework and they're successful at their homework, it, it still takes much more out of them. It's much more of an of a, um, onerous task for them. But I think we can look at that and think about how we can think about teaching individuals with ADHD. 
The other thing is really to think about can we subtype these neural signatures? So, so we get a, can we get a better idea about whether these different types of patterns of activation are associated with different subtypes of ADHD? ADHD is a very heterogeneous disorder, and we know that kids with ADHD get that label from a wide span and that they may very, uh, be very different from one another. So if we can do a better job of identifying what sort of kids fall into which sort of subtypes, they have different neural signatures, perhaps they respond differently to different types of treatment as well. So in our next, I'll talk a little bit more about this, we have a new endeavor where we're trying to decompose some of what we're looking at our tasks and get a better idea with the different subtypes of ADHD. And I'll talk more about this too, about how we know that issues with executive functioning as well as issues that, that fidgety fill had, such as hyperactivity and impulsivity and so forth, they're probably all related in some sense. And probably people have some of those symptoms more than others. And uh, I think people tend to not look at that as a global phenomenon. If we can, if it's a long-term goal, attempt to do some of that, we'll have a better handle on this disorder. So one of our current tasks is what we're doing, is we're going back to working memory again, but we're trying to do it in a more refined manner at this point, and we're looking at different strategies that kids with ADHD might use when they're doing working memory performance, and we're also very interested in subtyping. So we're looking for those kids who maybe have that slow cognitive tempo ADHD, those ones are sort of daydreamy, and then we're comparing them to kids with, with combined type of ADHD, the, the kids who are inattentive, hyperactive, and impulsive and trying to look on a neural level what the differences are. Turns out both of those groups of kids have working memory problems, but we think neurally the reasons for that is, are very different. And so that's what we're, we're trying to discover. In terms of our research, what we do in, the, in that project, we screen for the presence of ADHD for our ADHD subjects and for the absence of, of it and other disorders in our control subjects. This actually takes a fair amount of time. We, we spend several hours just doing the screening, so that involves behavioral testing as well, and then if subjects are interested and if they meet our criteria, then we go on to do the, do the neuroimaging tasks. And um, our subjects, they get gift cards and they also get a picture of their brain and if they want it on a t-shirt, we're also doing that for them. So they can walk around with their brain on their shirt. <laughs> so this is just a little bit about medication because people typically are also interested in medication. And this is a slide looking at what, what Ritalin does. Ritalin is the most common medication for ADHD, and it does tend to work. And what we looked at here is what happens when you give people with, um, with ADHD Ritalin and where it successfully treats them on a behavioral level and task performance, but also we did measures in their everyday life. And our data backed up some of what was found actually in, in normal control adults is that it looks like Ritalin works to decrease frontal activation. This is an area that's, um, that's very, it's a hot area, let's put it that way right now. Lots of people are interested in what the mechanism is behind of how uh, stimulants work. And our theory was that in these regions here, these are highly related to task performance, and we think the reason the activation actually decreased in our subjects is that activation was actually more focal at this point. So if you have a person who's inattentive and distracted, they have to look at a much wider window of stimuli that they're attending to. If their attention is more honed and narrow now, that actually results in a net decrease in a more efficient way of processing information. There are also increases in, in brain activation with methylphenidate. And in the ADHD population, it looks like it's in, in motor regions and sensory regions. Now the question I always get is, well, does medication normalize behavior and functioning? And it seemed to normalize behavior in terms of task performance, but it did not normalize brain activation because if it had, there wouldn't be any yellow spots, yellow or orange or red spots there. Because what this, these are different SMAPs. So this shows these are still areas where the control subjects are, are activating greater more than ADHD group and areas where the ADHD group is activating more than the controls. So again, we see, we see motor areas, the cerebellum, we see, do see a frontal area and um, some uh, caught basal ganglia and so forth, and they, where the normal controls are still using more anterior cingulate and left inferior frontal gyrus. So even when they're performing the task as well, they're doing it in a different manner. <laughs> 
This is actually one of my true loves in ADHD is impulsivity. I love impulsivity because I think that's really where people with ADHD get in trouble. So the inattention is an issue, but it's when that kid's out on the playground and he sees a toy and he doesn't care if someone else is playing with it, he just goes for it. Or he's in class and the teacher's about to ask a question but she hasn't finished and she thinks she's got the answer and she just blurts it out. So this is an area that I think has really been underlooked at for many years, even though we all recognize it's a huge problem with this population. And the way people for many years have been measuring impulsivity is they're using rating scales, which is useful, but it's also very subjective. And I, I have some concerns about how what we call ecologically valid it is, whether it really represents in terms of the problems that a person with ADHD has. And so this is an area that's gathered some increasing interest in, in, in the field. And there's actually some animal models of this that also have been illuminating. And this idea that's been followed for a few years, and, and particularly in uh, Norway, there's a group that's been looking at this, is this idea that there's what we call a shortened delay of reinforcement gradient in ADHD. And all that means is if you look at and reinforcers delivered out here, everybody knows the more delayed a reinforcer is to a behavior, the less affected it is. So if the reinforcer's here and the hours for response that's out here, it's going to have decreasing effectiveness on that behavior. But the idea is with ADHD, it stops working here, the reinforcer. Whereas for the, for the control subject, the idea is it would, it would be more effective for a longer period of time. So in other words, you, you have a high school student and you tell them, if you work really hard and you get a 3.0 average at the end of the semester, I'm going to get you a car. Well, that's a really long time away, and I would never recommend doing that, by the way. But it might work in some cases with a typical child. But with a child with ADHD, that's too far. They're doing instant messaging. They're finding other things to do. At the end of the semester, that could be 30 years from now. That's just not going to have the same impact on behavior. And so this is actually an area that I was very interested in many years ago. And so we started looking at that. And it was great for me because I was interested in looking at objective measures of impulsivity. And lo and behold, there was some other animal research that had been looking at that for many years. And they had worked out the methods in many ways to do it, but they hadn't, hadn't been applied to children very much. And so this is just an example of, of a paradigm that we did, and where we gave children the opportunity to choose between immediate re small reinforcer. They could get one nickel right away, or they could get three nickels in 16 seconds. And we gave them repeated choices over several sessions in over two days. And what we found is that the typical and the ADHD kids equally chose roughly about the same number of times to delay. So they were what we call more self-control. But as time went on, the control subjects became more self-controlled. So they could wait longer for those nickels. Whereas the ADHD subjects became less self-controlled. These little, the middle ones, bars here, are representative of one we, where we had an intervention, where we gave them music to listen to and games to play to see if that would help. The idea you're standing in line in a supermarket, and you just can't help it. You have to look at Star Magazine or People or something like that. So does it help to have other things to do while you're waiting? And it helped a little, but not that much. But I think they knew at the end they were getting out, and they could reimburse their nickels for their toys, and so I think that helped. But the idea is here that we could find an objective way that I thought was a valid way of measuring impulsivity in this population. And that you have to look over time, because if you just look at the first session, it's not going to tell you that much. But I'm sure parents of children with ADHD know that the impulsivity and the lack of patience can get worse over time. Well, I was also interested in physical behavior and how that related to it. So we had strapped on actometers where we measure motor movement. And what we found is that the ADHD children over time became much more active. And the typical children became a little more active. And in this, in this uh, paradigm, what I did, the children were in chairs that had wheels on them. And the ADHD, you could, because I videotape, it's beautiful. The ADHD children, the first session, they're moving a little. They're looking around. There's nobody in the room, but there's a mirror there so I can look in. And then gradually move a little bit more. By the end of the second session, they were flinging back and forth on the <laughs> chair. It's quite, quite interesting. And they were, no more, they were not looking around. They didn't care by that point. Whereas the typical children, they were strumming a little bit more on the side of the, of the, of the desk. That was about it. So many years later, I have, I have a colleague that I've been working with on some other areas. 
And it turns out there's this area that called neuroeconomics has become very fashionable lately. And in essence, they're looking at the same thing, but they're looking at the stat market and how people make economic decisions. And so again, the idea is, well, do you, do you stay in the market or do you switch or do you, do you sell? And so that's how many of them are looking. But essentially, it's the same, same idea. Do you, do you, how, what's going to govern your choices? And, and if you hit, get a reward today versus two weeks versus one month, how is that going to influence the value of reward? But what's cool now is that they found a way to look at that from a neuroimaging perspective, which we didn't have years ago. And so what they found in the immediate rewards were saying you can get a gift card today tends to activate regions that we know are associated directly with reward. So they, they were the first ones to demonstrate that. And what was also interesting was then they looked at and said, OK, what if you have a, a difficult choice versus an easy choice? What part of your brain is activated then? And the difficult choice would be, for instance, OK, you could have $18 today, or if you wait till tomorrow, you could have $20. Which would you rather do? That means you have to come back, you have to park, you have to go into the office. So, so you wait, it's a more difficult decision versus maybe $18 today, or you could have $20 in a year. I think the the choice is much easier in that situation. And so what they found is that they, people who are weighing these difficult decisions tend to involve more the prefrontal cortex, that area of executive functioning again. And so we have some hype. We're trying to do this now in children. We'll talk some more about that. But that's, um, we suspect that maybe children with ADHD are not able to bring those areas online. And perhaps it's part of the reason they do have some difficulty with delaying. So this is just an, uh, an example of something I actually did. It was my first published study when I was in, in, in graduate school. So I apologize for the quality of the, uh, of the graphs here. And what this is was looking at whether or not you could actually change behaviorally self-control. So could you in, in, increase patience or tolerance for delay? And this has actually become an area of great discussion lately. Otherwise, I wouldn't have brought it up since it was 1988. But a number of people have talked about this. Nora Volka, who's a director of NIDA, talking about ADHD as well, looking at substance abuse issues. And, and so I thought it would be worth dusting this off and bringing it out and show that, yes, you can do that. So what we did is we had children who were impulsive, young children, preschool age. And they, again, had to choose between immediate rewards and delayed rewards. And this is their choice of the delayed reward as time went on, as the delay increased. So when there's very little delay to the reward, they tended to choose the, the reward. If it was just 10 seconds, 5 seconds. But as the delay increased, they were, more, they were less likely to choose the delayed reward. And what I did after pretesting them, I just gradually increased the delay to the reward and then tested them again after. And what you can see is that their likelihood to choose the delayed reward was much greater. Not as successfully in all subjects, but certainly in some. And this was just a control subject to show if there's no intervention, there's not a whole lot that changes. But this is an idea, again, to look at what we can do from an intervention perspective. And the idea also, I think, to think looking to start looking at how people handle it differently. What I saw was some of the children who were most successful were able to do, again, verbal things. They were singing songs to themselves. They were making up stories and so forth during the delays, where I think the children who were less successful were doing sort of motor sorts of activities. And so just, I'm just going to say quickly, what do economics, the stock market, and chocolate have in common? And so this is what we're looking at, again, with that neuroeconomics. What they call neuroeconomics, I call ADHD research, but we're all working together. The idea is choices. Everybody has choices to make and how you value those choices and what's going to capture your choice. Is it going to be something that's immediately interesting to you, such as instant messaging, or is it going to be something like finishing your homework, which you don't, you don't get the reward for that until much later? So we're trying to look at that as well, and we'll be doing a behavioral testing with that. And then once we, we have a good idea about what the amounts are that we want to use and, and the delays and so forth, we hope to bring people, children with ADHD in, and image them as well. OK, so this is just, this is my favorite test. <laughs> this is a cookie delay test. I have a weakness for cookies. And this is actually one of the best tests, and this is just an example of how people have been able to link that impulsivity and executive functioning are related. And this test, all you do is you put a cookie underneath a cup, and you tell a child not to lift up the cup. And you time it and see how long it takes them to lift up the cup. <laughs> it's pretty straightforward. It gets what you need. So 
maybe it will be as, as, uh, as inventive as, as uh, Susan Campbell, who invented that task someday. I would like to introduce Lisa Litt right now, who will come up and talk to us a little bit about some of the plans uh, for the future we have in looking at genetic approaches, because we're also interested in finding improved ways for diagnosing ADHD, for furthering our understanding of the biological approaches of ADHD. In the long run, talking about maybe how treatment can also be informed by genetic approaches. Oh, I'm not done. <laughs> Is, is it the next slide? Yeah. Thank you, Julie. Um, my name is Lisa Litt, and I work in Frank Sharp's lab. And what we try and do is look in blood and see if we can find markers that will differentiate the different neurodevelopmental disorders. So what we're studying right now is Tourette's disorder. And anybody familiar with Tourette's disorder, this is a tick disorder. And most people associate this with coprolalia, or uttering obscenities. And that's actually only present in a very small percentage of Tourette's kids. But in fact, a lot of Tourette's kids have comorbid ADHD and or OCD. So some kids have both ADHD and OCD. And some kids just have one or the other. And so what we did is we looked at the blood of 30 different kids with Tourette's with some combination of ADHD and or OCD. And what we found, to our surprise, was that we could actually separate out these kids. So each dot on this um, plot is one of the Tourette's subjects. And these are kids ranging in age from 5 to 17. And if you look at the green dots, these are the kids that have only ADHD along with their Tourette's. And it turns out that they cluster in a nice little tight group. And if you look at the kids with OCD, there they are, the blue dots, and they cluster in another group. And you can't really tell on this picture, but in fact, the purple dots and the red dots, which, rec which represent either kids with both conditions or kids with neither conditions, are actually also separated. And you have to rotate this picture in order to be able to see that. And what we have is we have different genes that identify these different groups. So hopefully, by looking at what these profiles are for each of these groups, we can start to understand some of the biological mechanisms that might be sitting underneath some of these disorders. And a big question that we have now is, when you look at the kids that have ADHD, either with or without OCD inside of Tourette's, are they different than kids that just have ADHD but that don't have Tourette's? And this is a question that people have doing, been doing a lot of research on for a long time. But by looking at the blood of kids that have just ADHD and comparing it to kids with Tourette's and ADHD, we might actually be able to identify whether the ADHD that's present in these kids with Tourette's is indeed a separate condition that's the same as kids that just have ADHD alone, or whether it actually is a completely different condition biologically that's going along with the Tourette's. So that's basically what we do. And by starting to look now outside the kids with Tourette's and kids with just ADHD or kids with just OCD, or kids with autism, we can start to understand the biological mechanisms and how they're different in all these kids. And we can do it by looking at the blood. So that's basically what we're working on. Thank you. Our lab has also been very interested in looking at cognitive control. Dr. Fassbender will explain some of the work she's been doing here and her goals. This is an area she's been working for many years with typically developing adults. And there's a clear implications for ADHD as well. Thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Catherine Fassbender. And I've been working with Dr. Schweitzer for a couple of years now. And I'm going to talk to you very briefly about something I'm very interested in, which is um, cognitive control and performance monitoring. Um, so in order to control behavior, um, we need to, um, a number of different brain areas and a number of different um, brain techniques need to work in, um, together in order to um, exercise cognitive control. And um, if the brain is uh, very efficient, 
So um, at the beginning, when we're learning something, we need to pay a lot of attention to it. But if we practice many, many times, it eventually will become automatic. So if you think about learning how to drive a car, for instance, when you start learning how to drive, you have to think, oh, I have to check my rear view mirror, got to check my side mirrors, got to monitor the road in front. But after a while, this becomes automatic to the point where you may drive to work one morning and forget what route you took to work. And this is a good thing because it frees up resources um, so we don't have to um, focus too much on simple everyday tasks and we can think about other things and multitask. Um, but as you can imagine, this is not always the best thing to do. So there has to be some system that's monitoring all the time to see whether you need to call on the prefrontal cortex in order to engage control over a situation. And that's exact, exactly what um, the performance monitoring system is thought to do. Um, so Rabbit in 1966 um, was the first person to discover that after people make an error, they tend to slow down. So this is a very um, direct way. You make an error, it has an influence on how you're behaving. So when you make an error, um, a little um, thing goes off in your brain, which we call the oops response. And um, it's thought to be generated by um, the anterior cingulate cortex, which is a midline region. Um, and the ACC is thought to send this oops response signal back to the frontal cortex, which then actively exercises control. So for instance, if you're not being careful enough and you're racing along doing a task, you make an error, a signal goes off, it tells prefrontal cortex, hey, we need to slow down here, this is not as easy as we initially thought. Um, so we can think of it um, like the amber light when we're driving a car. Um, if you see an amber light, it means you're going to have to slow down, pay a little bit of attention. Something might happen, which you may have to stop or you may ha just have to be more careful for a little period of time. So luckily, making an error isn't the only thing that makes us um, um, change our behavior. But the likelihood that an error will occur is enough to do that as well. And one situation... Um, which, um, under which an error is very likely to occur is something called response conflict. And what I mean by that is when two alternative responses are simultaneously triggered. So, for instance, if we have a right hand and a left hand response simultaneously triggered, so they're duking it out there, um, the brain has to work out which one is the dominant one, which is the more suitable one to carry out. So. The two responses are triggered, um, a signal goes off in ACC, um, this signals the referee of the brain, the frontal cortex, and depending on the task rules, your previous learning on a situation, your prefrontal cortex will decide which is the appropriate response, and it will lend weight to that response. So in this case, it might say um, right-hand response is the appropriate one here. So then the right-hand response will win, essentially. Um, what happens in the case of an error is an error will happen, the anterior cingulate cortex will fire, it'll send a signal back to the prefrontal cortex, which will say, slow down, we need to be more careful here so that we don't make another error. So what does this mean for ADHD? Um, in general, um, participants with ADHD don't slow down after an error in the same way that um, healthy controls do. Um, and brain imaging has taught us a number of things as well about how ADHD participants react to errors. They tend to not show the same type of oops response. And um, also, they tend to have problems with later evaluative processes, which normally help us to learn from the fact that we've made an error. So um, it, it, not just the oops response, but a couple of seconds later when you're trying to work out, why did I make that error? What does that mean for how I'm going to correct my behavior? Those processes as well are affected. Um, so just a little cartoon just to go over what I said. What happens when we make an error or when conflict occurs in the brain? A signal goes off. Um, ACC is thought to generate the signal. That signal is fed back to PFC, um, which then exerts some kind of control over the situation. And then eventually that will feed back to um, conflict detection centers and the conflict will be reduced. So the studies that we are um, currently conducting here at The Mind, um, we're interested in looking in ADHD 
what part of the process is affected? At what level does the problem occur? Does it occur when you're detecting the error or the conflict? Is it some sort of um, connectivity problem between um, midline areas and prefrontal cortex? Or is it actually the prefrontal cortex ex itself? Is it underactive? Is it not firing as it should be? And um, that, in turn, compromising its ability to affect cognitive control. And particularly, we're interested in seeing how different ADHD subtypes may differ in what level, um, at what level the problem is occurring. Thank you. Okay, one other study called the Should I Stay or Should I Go task. And this is the idea of looking at flitting around. It's a very simple paradigm, and essentially it's, again, a choice task where people make or making decisions. And, but what we're trying to get at is whether or not there's actually differences in neurotransmitter functioning. And it turns out that we can look at very simple me measure, look at pupil diameter, and that'll give us a window into whether or not there's changes and tonic and phasic uh, release of norepinephrine and whether or not they're associated with whether a person decides to stay with do, working on their taxes or instead go and do some instant messaging. And so again, people are faced with choices all the time and people with ADHD oftentimes have a hard time staying on task and we think that there are, neuro, there are differences in neurotransmitters and this is potentially a simple way of doing this. This method has already been established in looking at undergraduate control subjects, and we're adapting it for our population. So this study, we're not quite ready to launch yet, but we're, we're getting close. And this will, be, this will involve adults and adolescents for this, for this uh, study. Another project that we're, we're starting to embark on is one where we're looking at the use of telemedicine. And this really become, became, uh, was generated because there was so much interest, one at UC Davis, because there's a, a wealth of experience in people here. But also it just really was the right combination of people who happened to be t together at the right time. And we're looking at being able to access people and provide services in a much, much wider way in, in places where people may not have services for evaluation or for treatment of ADHD. We have one study that's been funded. Yuhan Z is here, I think, tonight. And she is a, a child and adolescent psychiatry fellow. And she has a study that was funded by the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry to, do, uh, to measure the effects of telemedicine and parent training. So this is a study that will start hopefully within the next few months, where we should be looking at the effects of telemedicine on teaching parent training skills. And this is actually a study that's local. So even though it's telemedicine, we're testing it just between rooms and different buildings or buildings across campus. So if parents are interested in, in learning some parent training skills, we'll be happy to uh, speak with them. And I think there will be a, a notebook out there where people can write their name down and so forth, and we could get in touch with you. We're also looking at doing this on a wider basis with some other uh, faculty within UC Davis and looking at, again, about outreach to, to, on, on a wider basis. And uh, there's a number of people involved in this preliminary project, including uh, Elizabeth, Dr. Elizabeth Miller in Department of Pediatrics, Dr. Joshua Breslau in the Center for Health Disparities, uh, Dr. Richard Pan in Department of Pediatrics, and uh, Dr. Peter Yellowies, and, and potentially some other faculty in, in psychiatry. So just in terms of long-term goals is that we're hoping that we can improve our methods for a diagnosis for ADHD. We're hoping part of that is based on our work that we're doing in subtypes, so we're able to identify more carefully what the signatures are of the different disorders that we all encapsulate in this one broad definition of ADHD. And that we're hoping that we can also identify treatment methods, whether they be behavioral, educational, pharmacological, or some combination that are more targeted and specific to the specific issues that people with ADHD present. We're also hoping to open a clinic. And we're, the clinics will be for children and adults with ADHD. And we'll be offering services in regard to evaluation in regard to parent training, as I mentioned, hopefully we'll be doing some school mental health as well. And we hope to do more in regard to community outreach. We're still at the formative stages of uh, determining what would be the best for the, for the community as well as um, be a nice um, mesh for, for the uh, 
health system as well. And we have a number of people on our team, and this is our, our number of people that are primary individuals in our team. These are associated members as well that we have. And at this point, I'd be happy to entertain any questions, and I thank you for your attention. What would you recommend to those parents who are getting information from schools that, you know, I'm pretty sure your child has ADHD, but they're saying, I don't know. What would be your recommendation? Well, at that point, what they're essentially they're telling you is that they really think you need to go for an evaluation. And there are a number of individuals out there. Our clinic isn't quite set up yet. So we do, in, in, um, in the form of our research, we do provide some evaluations if, if there's children who might meet our, our criteria. Uh, but that's their next step. And then there are a number of professionals who do evaluate for ADHD. So there are psychologists, there are psychiatrists, there are pediatricians, and some of it depends on whether or not it's straight ADHD or there's a concern about learning disabilities and so forth. But some of it also depends on what resources you have in terms of insurance. And it's worth comparing across. It's worth talking to a number of different places and talking to them and, and seeing what services they offer and so forth. I understand correctly because diagnosis for ADHD right now is by filling out forms, right? I mean, mostly that's how it's done. That's the primary way. And again, that's what differs from person to person. So it could, a lot of it is filling out forms. Sometimes it's filling out forms and observations. Sometimes it's filling out forms, observations, and testing. So when we do it in our research, it's about a four to six hour evaluation. So, but sometimes, that's not practical in certain settings, and they don't have the resources to do that. And a lot of that is also for looking at comorbidity. So if you think the person has learning disabilities, anxiety, depression, and so forth, then you've got to assess for that as well. But at this point, the, the rating scales are certainly where you start, and that would be parent and teacher. Well, I guess what I was going to say is, so we filled out all the forms, and I've fought ADHD for a while. <laughs> So, because I didn't want to give the medication. But I did find out he had auditory processing problems. So my question is, I mean, is it possible that even though the doctor who's a very high level, well-known doctor in neurology said, okay, I got extra forms, the teachers filled them all out, he's got ADHD and he's not hyperactive, he's the other kind that you were talking mm -hmm. about? Is it, I mean, I know it's possible to have both, but how do you tell the difference? I mean. With that, is there a way to tell the difference just with forms? I mean, is that logical? That well, who diagnosed auditory processing? Um, the neurologist. I'd rather not mention it. Okay, no, that's okay. I can okay. tell you directly, but I wouldn't no, like no, no, to No, 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 that's okay. Me. But that's something that there are, you could speech and hearing people, and then I would, at that point, I would try to have a team meeting where people got together and discuss it. But you can certainly have both. It's not unusual. That's one of the issues with ADHD is that they oftentimes have both, and one can look like the other, and... The root of it may be similar. The late leading to blue? Okay. I'm interested in what I guess would be the comorbidity of oppositional defiant disorder with um, ADHD. You said it's 45 to 64 percent. Is that inherent in the ADHD, or do you think it's a result of the reaction from society and school and parents and et cetera? I don't have direct data to quote to you on that. I think it depends on the situation. But I suspect that's, and I think there's some evidence for this, that this is sort of a variant. This is a subtype. I think some of that kit could be environmental. But I also do think there are certain children that there's a biological reason why they're more likely to have the, where the impulsivity and so forth results in that. But there are certainly children who have the ADHD full-fledged and don't have the oppositional defiant disorder as well. The Brown? I was curious about the implications of, the, of some of the research in an educational setting, uh, specifically the, um, the research on visualization. I was wondering whether you thought it was likely to be helpful to students um, to use visualization in learning and memory tasks. Personally, I don't think there's enough research yet going on in this area, but I think so, and, and also more tactile. And so I think the more, those cues are, are, I think children with ADHD learn, do learn better that way. And also one of the problems with auditory 
which is what is typically used in classrooms where people just say a, uh, an instruction, is that's fleeting. It disappears. And if something's visual, you can hang on to it for longer. So it's less of a demand on the working memory system. But I think that's an area that we'd like to pursue here, actually. I have a family history of ADHD, and I have a four-year-old that's been diagnosed with sensory integration disorder. And her psychologist says that more than likely, the sensory integration issues are going to go away, and we're going to see more ADHD-like behavior. And I'm just wondering how um, young are the people in your studies? Are you going to start looking at younger children? Um, at this point, we're, our children are, are, are older. We're looking at children eight, nine, and so forth. And that's, that's currently, but that's because of the tests that we're using and because of the imaging. It's just too difficult for the young children. In the past, we've certainly looked at children that young. And that's not to say in the future that we wouldn't. It just so happens right now. But I think eventually, really to, to really get to the root of some of the ans answers that we need, we will have to go to younger ages as well. I think there's a gentleman back there. Oh, yep. yes. You. <laughs> I have a question. Um, have there been any research done on you know, like gifted children that are people that are children that are considered <laughs> gifted, but also have ADHD? So, there are certainly a number of children who are gifted and do have ADHD. We know that. So ADHD sometimes can be associated with lower IQ, but we certainly know that anybody can have ADHD. And we know that I, higher IQ is protective in some sense. So people who do have a higher IQ and ADHD tend to do better in life. The outcome studies suggest that. But I don't know about studies beyond that. In the black. I was wondering if you have a timeline for your clinic. Very good question. Um, I would say within the next few months. So we're at this point, we're going over the details. So we're trying to figure out where and billing codes and, and things like that, which, so we're trying to resolve those issues. Can you go back and say what you were talking about with the pupil diameters? Oh, um, sure. What, what was that pointing to? What is that going to tell you? So that's actually a way, this, this, these were studies that were originally done in monkeys, and they found out that when they measured the pupil, they could actually look at norepinephrine functioning in the brain. So you can look at release of norepinephrine, which is a neurotransmitter that we know is involved in, in, in ADHD. So this is just a, a method of measuring how neurotransmitter is associated, different changes are associated with behavior. So we know that there are changes and uh, norepinephrine functioning when one is about to explore a task. So when one is on a task and persisting and doing well, their norepinephrine is in this part of the brain is fairly stable, but then when they're about to switch and do something else, it turns out that the pupil, there's changes in the pupil. And, we, and by this monkey research, they've shown that that's a way in terms of measuring changes in the locus ceruleus, a part of the brain that's hard to get to through imaging methods in humans at least. Um, so that's a task that we think it, it's not invasive, it's fairly simple, and yet can tell us something perhaps very basic about individuals, the ADHD with, in, in regard to a behavior that's problematic. Can, 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 would that be considered stress? I mean, is that, does it translate that easily to, do you see the norepinephrine, you know that they're having a harder time? I, at this, I don't think it is related. That's, I don't think the, the research, I think there could be some of that related to it, but I think it's, it certainly seems like if it's difficulty related in that sense. So that, and essentially what they're doing is paradigm, they're opting out for something that is easier and the rewards are, e are easier to get. Over here. My son has, um, is great at auditory. Anything he hears he can absorb, but he's unable to sit down and put it down on paper and follow and do his tasks. Is that common with ADHD? Because he was diagnosed with it. With the medications, he's able to sit down and put it out and write it out. But otherwise, he's not. But he does absorb everything comprehended. Well, again, ADHD is very heterogeneous. That's unusual. I don't typically hear that. But I would, I would think what they're probably responding to the people who are diagnosed him is he may hear it. He may be able to put it down. But the question is, is he able to follow the instruction? And so essentially, you're going to get that diagnosis if you're not able to follow through. I had a question regarding drug uh, using the drugs uh, 
in the early age, you know, as a parent, you read a lot of information, um, parent magazine and such, that children that use Ritalin or Adderall for a sustained time will eventually be adults that could have drug problems later. Could you speak to that a little bit? Sure. That's a, that's a question that's a very reasonable question. And there's actually now a, n a number of studies that have been able to follow children who were medicated versus not medicated, who were medicated as children, and they're now adolescents and adults. And if actually what they found is that the medication tends to be protective. So they actually see a decreased use of illicit substances if they are treated with medication. So in that sense, one could speculate that perhaps they're less impulsive, Maybe there's other issues. Maybe they're able to attend in school. They have better self-esteem and so forth. But for any rate, they actually show that the medication is helpful to, to decrease the likelihood of substance abuse. You have a follow-up? No, okay. Uh, have there, is there any correlation between, let's say, a mother that was taking drugs when she was pregnant and uh, ADHD. And the second question I had is, are there any kind of typical symptoms for OCD? So in, gar in regards to you talking about prenatal uh, exposure, so this is another hot area. And the early evidence was, was mixed. The early evidence was not suggesting that there were tremendous negative effects that we had all expected from prenatal exposure. But there are some suggestions that there are some issues. Uh, but when you look at control groups who are in a similar environment, it seems like the environmental causes in general, the living situations are actually as profound as a prenatal exposure. I'm actually part of a funded study, though, that, that's at University of Maryland and National Institutes of Drug Abuse, where we're now bringing children in who are between 11 13 will follow them until they're about 15 years of age. And that's some of what we're looking at. Because part of the thought is that if those symptoms do occur, we may not see them until we think prefrontal cortex is further developed, which is about adolescence. So there's a number of groups looking at that right now. And I don't think we have a clear answer at this point. The other part of it, any oh, sorry. symptoms for the OCD? Oh, symptoms for the OCD. Well, there are, very, there are rating scales or interviews that are, are very clear. So OCD is obsessions and compulsions. So obsessions are rumative thoughts where one has a thought again and again and again, and it interferes with being able to get something done. Um, compulsions are the actions are doing something again and again and not being able to get things, any, things done. At least, any else that, at least anything else you can think to add and beyond. But those are occasionally actually get people who do have OCD, just the OCD and think it's ADHD because they're not completing their tasks, they're not getting anything done because they're essentially redoing some of the same things over and over again. In the pink. My um, daughter has where, she, where it gets quiet, and then everything internally, externally, will get more pronounced, like pencil marks. Um, or she'll hear things more pronounced when it's really quiet. So she likes having the extra background noises. Mm -hmm. It helps her to cope, I guess. Where do I put that in which window, which category would that be? I mean, is that OCD-ish? Is that, uh, I mean, I'm thinking anxiety. Well, I don't, unfortunately, I don't think it's diagnostic. Um, I think, and there, there are people who are like that, whether they have a diagnosis or not. They're just people who, the question is whether that really interferes with her ability to function. But certainly, there are individuals like that. We know that in the 70s and 80s, what they used to do with kids with ADHD, they would put them in very sterile environments and these um, work carols that were on, had three sides around them were they completely blank and they had, there was nothing to look at. And that actually increased their ADHD behavior. And so they learned that was not a viable uh, intervention. And instead, actually, there was a, a group in uh, Indiana, Sydney Zentel, that actually looked at putting instead the opposite, giving them some stimulation, putting, using actually colored um, pages and so forth for them to do that work, and that tend to help. Because the kid with ADHD is bored, they're going to create their own noise. So, so you don't want that happening. But it's finding that happy medium. Uh, concerning uh, medicine, uh, are we controlling the behavior with the medicine and 
not stimulating or, or failure to stimulate the brain at the same time. Um, we have a balancing act here to do with medicine. We've been told that until you reach 30 milligrams of anything, you're really not addressing the problem. That 10 and 15 milligrams are insignificant uh, in most cases. Mark so, you know, as a parent and grandparent, where do you go with this? Well, again, it's, it's a balancing act, like you said. And I think when people are on appropriate doses and they're responding well, you don't tend to get a restriction of creativity and behavior. But what I do think needs to happen is that there needs to be much more careful assessment. And so people need to look at it on, our, on an ongoing basis and not just assume, now I'm not a psychiatrist, so I have to make this disclaimer here, I'm not a physician. Um, but I do think people have to be careful about when they are medicating to do ongoing checks of behavior. And if there's really a concern, we used to do placebo tests as well. So we had pharmacies who would work with us and the child, the teacher, the parents would know whether it was the active drug or if it was a placebo. And I think sometimes it's a really excellent way of telling that maybe not enough people try that out. So then you are able to find out what, what the best dose is to meet all the symptoms. But you do have to look across behaviors. You can't just look at school behavior. You have to look at peer interactions and so forth and get the big picture. It's important to do that. Well, I also find that pediatricians, uh, as a rule, are reluctant to go above a minimum level of uh, milligrams for any of this medicine because I think, frankly, they're afraid to do it. Um, so it just, you know, it just leaves you in a wilderness here. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in that case, I think you have, to, you have to be the child's advocate and discuss that. But also, sometimes people who are uncomfortable, don't have as much experience with the medications, may not be as comfortable at looking at um, uh, different dosing and so forth. And then you might want to consider consulting with the psychiatrist at that point. Lisa? Can you briefly comment on behavioral intervention as opposed to medication? Sure. So behavioral interventions have been around for many, many years in ADHD. And there was a classic study a number of years ago that compared behavioral interventions to pharmacology. And what they did was in this study, this is called the MTA study, they not only compared it to medication, but they compared it to the best medication. So they tried a number of different types of medications, and they actually tried different doses. So they really knew that these children weren't optimal medications for, for, them, for themselves. And what they found is that medication actually was superior in regard to addressing ADHD symptoms and behavioral interventions. Many of us were hoping that the combination of the two would be far superior. And we were surprised to learn that it, it was just minimally different. It wasn't significantly different at that point. Now, that's for the ADHD symptoms. It turns out, for all the associated symptoms, such as the defiant behavior, the anxiety, lots of the other issues, it turns out the behavioral interventions were what really made a difference and what were needed. So at this point, many of us still recommend that behavioral interventions being used, or should be used to treat those associated problems as well. Also, I think there's other issues in terms of looking at self-esteem for the parent and for the child that I think behavioral interventions uh, can address. But further than that, I think behavioral interventions, there's been a number of them that have been exquisitely designed, but I think we can push the envelope further. And I think with a lot of the research we hope to do here, I think we can look at some of our findings from our neurosciences research as well and look at how we can develop new behavioral interventions that are more specifically tailored and have, uh, are, are more optimal, more effective for specific individuals. Um, what are the um, effects, if any, on omega-3 fatty acids and working memory and ADHD symptoms? That is an excellent question. And I don't know the data at this point, but I know people are looking at that. I know that's been an active area of research for a few years. But at this point, I, I can't speak to, the, uh, to any findings. Right Hi, um, the CDC data says that California's diagnosis and treatment rate is a lot lower than the rest of the country. I'm sorry, no, it's a lot lower than the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. And you know, Californians kind of pride themselves in leading things. And why is California lagging in this? In terms, of, that's interesting. I hadn't heard that before. I, well, I'm, I'm new to California, at least this time around. I lived 20 years ago. I lived in a southern in Southern California. 
Well, I, I hadn't heard that. And it would be interesting. A third of the East Coast. Sorry? The diagnosis rate in California is like less than, less than half, mm. closer to a third of what it is with the East Coast. That's interesting. And I don't know if it has to do with the pockets. So if there's po the population is more spread out here in many places than it is on the East Coast, if that has something to do with it, if that has something to do, to do with practitioner availability and so forth. It also may be a progressive progressiveness instead of latent diagnosis that may show, you know, advanced diagnosis. I mean, you can't determine that that means that the West Coast is worse than the East Coast just because of that finding. Exactly, that's a finding, but the underlying uh, reasons for it need to be investigated further. So I'd have to, I'd have to look at that. A lot of doctors in the Midwest still think ADHD is a myth. Yeah. <laughs> so. Back here? I don't know if there's an answer to my question, but I work for a Title I school um, with probably half homeless students and very low socioeconomic backgrounds. And I'm just curious, a lot of educators, or I don't want to point anybody out, but a lot of people want to just say, due to these symptoms, they have ADHD. How do you keep from overdiagnosing? I guess is kind right. of the question. That's, it's difficult, because unless you have a stable environment, I think oftentimes it's difficult to determine that. But essentially what you need to have is look at the child over time to get information from as number of resources as possible. The other thing is to really look across the environments and see if there's a difference. We know ADHD is affected by environment in the sense that, that symptoms tend to, be, tend to change. If you're in a structured environment, they may be less prevalent, the symptoms. But overall, somebody with ADHD on some level if, it's, if it really is functionally impairing their behavior, you're going to see it across situations. So I think that really is a crucial part of it. And there are times when we've been in clinics before in the past where I've seen this, a similar issue, and I think there are times people have to take their children off the medication and see what happens. And again, placebos are oftentimes a way of doing that. But very, doing a thorough diagnostic evaluation and doing it over time I think is key. I was wondering if you could kind of give a comparison between uh, Adderall and Ritalin, because they say they do different things. Right, and it, it depends on the, the individual. So the chemical make they're, they're related, but the chemical makeup is different. And it, it turns out sometimes individuals respond better to Ritalin, and sometimes they respond better to Adderall. And it just... Is it affecting different parts of the brain? I mean, is it, is it actually stimulating a different area? It pro to some extent, and there's, there, there haven't been many head-to-head -head tests looking at that functionally. I mean, one would think so based on, on, on its chemical makeup. But I don't recall any um, imaging studies where they've actually compared it head-to-head. -head. But one would think so, depending. And it's clear that some children respond like that to Adderall and some respond, and, and it's a balance with the side effects as well. That's oftentimes how the decision is made. You go over here, there's... Mm -hmm. You? I, uh, I was wondering if there is comorbidity also between uh, ADHD and sleep disorders. I hear that a lot, and yet I didn't see that up on your graph. Right. Right. That's an area of interest that, that a number of people have, and there's, people have different takes on it. So it looks like there are areas of the brain, such as the cerebellum and so forth, that are implicated in both. And so some of it probably is that there are some basic reasons for why there is a relationship there. But also, with some children, they have a hard time sleeping. If they have ADHD, they have a hard time settling down. Of course, if it, sometimes it can be stimulant-induced if they have a dose that's too late. There's also some literature that some people were saying the problem is lots of these children don't have ADHD, they're just not getting enough sleep. But I think at this point, there's been two or three studies now to establish that there is actually some direct relationship there. But it's, there isn't a lot of research in that area, but it's, there's some. Just a comment on that. Um, children that come from violent backgrounds, um, violence also could cause symptoms of ADHD, and the sleep issue is mm -hmm. one of those issues with children from violent or some type of neglect type backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And continuing on to that, I work in a 
uh, program uh, with incarcerated men, and we have domestic violence, uh, violence but not to intimate partners, and, and drug use all in one unit with a lot of overlap. And uh, 60 to 75 percent of the folks that I work with would easily make six symptoms there. Um, are there studies on that you can recall on incarcerated populations? When I was in graduate school, I was taught that if a child had ADHD and also conduct disorder, conduct disorder of setting fires, stealing, lying, and so forth, if they had both of those disorders by the age of eight, there was an 80% chance that by the age of 16, they were likely to commit a felony offense. So I think there probably is a high rate, and I suspect it's also not being addressed very well. Any, any uh, relationship between ADHD and early reading problems, reading disorders? Well, we know there's a high rate of comorbidity, so lots of children with ADHD do have learning disorders as well. Um, sometimes that can just be the impulsivity where a child isn't slowing down enough to read or, or attending well enough, but it's beyond that. It's clear that even when you treat the ADHD, a number of children still have, uh, there's still a higher rate of, of reading and math and other academic disorders and so forth. Is your clinic primarily for research for ADHD or is it going to provide resources for parenting and social skills? Right. Well, our, we, for our, our clinic goals are to provide clinic resources, so it'll be separate from our, what we do in our research. So within, in the context of our research, we do some work in, in terms of screening and, and so forth for our, for our subjects, but and there will, as I said, we also have um, studies where we're hoping to do parent training as well, but then within the clinic, we're hoping to provide some resources just as you've spoken about. Um, you said that stimulant medications normalize behavioral fun symptoms but not brain functioning. What are the implications of that for education? Well, I think what that means is that the brain still is not working in the way that a, that a typically developing person is. So again, I think strategies, so for instance, when I interviewed those men who were performing equally well on, on a task, still the strategies that they were using when they were performing the tasks were different. So underlying, I think the strategies that people are using are not going to change, especially if they're adults and they're being medicated. These are strategies they've been doing for decades. It's not going to change that easily. But perhaps they, are, they might be uh, more easily educable in, in different strategies. And pe but people haven't looked at that. That's, that's a very underdeveloped area. Well, thank you for your time, and again, for your attention. Thank you for coming out tonight. The UC Davis Mind Institute began in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, learning disabilities, and other brain disorders is helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please call or visit our website to find out more about current studies, our research team, and upcoming events.